welcome to a new edition of Hitting the Field. I'm Barmel Lyons, and joined with me is Justin Garfield and Joshua Thicklin. All right, so guys, NBA All-Star Weekend is now behind us, and what a weekend it was. I mean, Justin, what did you find to be the most entertaining part about the whole entire weekend? You know what I was really surprised about? I really like the All-Star game itself. I was looking more forward to the other things, but... The All-Star game itself, 196 to 173, the final. Russell Westbrook, the MVP, with 31 points. I really like it when all these stars come out, when there's no defense played, and they just have a score fest. It's like the highlight factory all over again. Awesome. Josh, what about you? What was your favorite part about the entire I weekend? think, surprisingly, um, I was actually very not very pessimistic about mm -hmm. All-Star Saturday night, but it ended up, to me, being like really exciting. We had one of the greatest... Of saying that contest of all time between Eric Gordon and Zach Levine, it was something that we hadn't really seen before. One, I have to say, um, Aaron Gordon brought some new creativity that this, this contest needed, and having both of those guys go head to head really was like you know a crowning achievement for the All Star Game to possibly bring back the excitement that the Sound of Contest once had. So I know it sounds like I'm changing my tune, but these guys forced me to do so. No, I definitely understand. So. ESPN released their top 100 players of all time list last week. I mean, that list had Michael Jordan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and LeBron James, which finished in one, two, and three. Josh, what were you surprised at, you know, seeing at the on the list? Who were you most surprised with? Well, I think anyone who's taking a peek at that top 10 list, um, there's one thing that stands out above all else is the fact that Kobe Bryant is not in the top 10. And, and you know, it's kind of almost ridiculous, borderline disrespectful, only for the fact that Kobe's resume stacked up with people in the top five. It, his actually soars above some people in the top three. So one, one thing, I, that's one thing that stood out for me without a doubt. Even, like, ah, it's just blatantly disrespectful. When you do these lists, you always have to think, put in, you know, put in the fact that if you want to take someone in, put someone in the top 10, you got to take someone out. For me, I would have took out Hakeem Olajuwon at number 10 um, because Kobe's resume, uh, Hakeem is a two-time NBA champion, an MVP, and one of the greatest centers of all time. Kobe Bryant's a five-time NBA champion. Like... I, I just feel it's ridiculous, to be honest. Very true. Justin, what do you think about the whole situation? Well, I'll spare you for Hakeem Olajuwon <laughs> right now as a guy from Houston, but I will say that Kobe Bryant definitely deserved to be at least number five on this list. He's definitely proved it all throughout his career. He had that killer instinct that no other player really had other than Michael Jordan. He was not afraid to take that last shot, never afraid to go dunk on the biggest guy in the court. That's just the kind of thing you loved about Kobe Bryant and what he really brought to this game in the post Michael. Michael Jordan era it became the the Kobe Bryant era. I'm really gonna miss Kobe, and I think he deserves top five on this list, hands down. Well, and another thing that we have to point out: a lot of people, the most of the outrages come from LeBron James at number three. Mm -hmm. Now, LeBron James is an amazing player, one of the greatest players of all time. I think putting him at number three right now is premature. Even his resume stacked up to number four, Magic Johnson's. We're looking at Magic. Magic is a five-time NBA champion. And like you know, is oh, I say four-time, four-time NBA champion. Also with LeBron, his stats are up there. They are top three worthy. But right now, his accolades haven't matched up with it yet. I think if this is going from a pure player standpoint, mm -hmm. sure LeBron deserves to be in the top five, maybe top three. You can make an argument for him. But I kind of see where you're coming from. It is a little premature. He's still only 31 years old. You got to remember, and they already ranked him ahead of Kobe, Magic Johnson, Shaq. And Larry Bird. all those guys, Hakeem Olajuwon, <laughs> Larry on. Bird, <laughs> my goodness. LeBron, like, they're really putting him up there. They're ready for him to maybe take over Michael Jordan, but I don't think that's going to happen at all anytime soon. All right, well, lastly, the NBA trade deadline is this week, um, so which means some of the favorite players could be moving on. Let's discuss some trade scenarios that could really shake things up around the league. Josh, which player do you think needs a trade, and where would be his best fit? I think the biggest name on you know on the trading block mm -hmm. this time around is Dwight Howard. Um, Dwight Howard, this five years ago, was undoubtedly the number one center in the game. Now, five years later, um, he's thirty years old. He's in his thirties. Mm -hmm. He has a bad back, bad knees, and a two, and a bad contract, so, which is something that a lot of teams don't want to take on. So I think the best fit poss possibly for Dwight is there have been talks of him going to Boston, but then again, Boston's they're looking at a you know a front court that's 
seems prepared to like move forward. So it's really a sad thing to look at. I don't, I don't know where Dwight's going to land with that contract. What about you, Justin? I look at a guy like Jeff Teague from the Atlanta Hawks going to a team that needs a little bit of leadership like the Utah Jazz. You look at the Jazz, they're currently sitting at 7th in the West, and this could be the first time they make the playoffs in a number of years. Mm -hmm. But if they're going to survive that rigorous West, they need a leader who's been battle-tested in the postseason because none of those guys really do have that experience. Jeff Teague was the number one seed last year with the Atlanta Hawks. He made it all the way to the conference finals. I think he got that team to the promised land, potentially. Definitely. All right. Thanks, guys. Coming up, we'll be joined by Rachel White to talk about baseball and softball here at the University of Central Florida. In Central Florida is the perfect place to study, earn a degree, and, of course, to enjoy everything that Central Florida has to offer. From theme parks to dinner shows and, of course, the movies, Orlando offers many unique and exciting activities to do. However, we all know that a ticket to any of these attractions can be expensive, especially on a college student budget. UCF Student Government Association has the nights covered with the SGA Ticket Center. Located at the heart of campus inside Student Union, SGA Ticket Center offers tickets at a special discounted price to UCF students, faculty, and staff. Not only do they have discounted tickets for theme parks, but they also have discounted tickets for other attractions like Blue Man Group, Pirates Dinner Adventure, and Kennedy Space Center. Save your money and experience all Orlando has to offer. For more information, you can visit their website. Dangerous driving extends beyond just speeding, especially in the rain where light usage can be the most dangerous thing you do. This high-performance sports car might be able to handle tight corners in the rain, but if the driver can't see drivers around him, it just doesn't matter. Driving with your hazard lights on is illegal in the state of Florida, regardless of weather conditions. Hazard lights are only to be used while stopped on the side of the road. It makes it easier for emergency services to distinguish cars stopped on the shoulder. Not driving with your hazards on also makes turn signals clearly visible along with brake lights. Increasing the visibility of your car in the rain will make your trips infinitely safer. And of course, remember that speed is the most important thing you can control while driving in severe weather. Speed and low grip are a deadly combination at any level of driver skill. For more information, visit your local Florida Department of Transportation office or the website shown below. Control the roads and enjoy the journey. Welcome back to Hitting the Field. Rachel White now joins us. The UCF softball team started its season with a 4-1 and one record at its home tournament. Rachel, what impressed you most about the team's performance this weekend? I'd have to say the pitching. We all knew coming in about Shelby Tournier. She's one of the best pitchers in the country. Obviously a big part of their very successful conference championship season last year. But the real question was who was going to step up and replace Mackenzie Otis. Obviously she was the strikeout leader for the entire UCF softball history. So obviously someone was going to have to step up. And this weekend it was... Manami Calixto, she's a new player coming in. And then also Jamie Yavari came in in relief and was very strong for the night. So I think that answered some of the questions about the pitching. And then also the top of the order was fantastic. Uh, Linnea Goodman, Brittany Solis, and Jessica Yavari, very strong in those one, two, three spots this weekend, provided a lot of offense for the Knights. And Justin, what do you think? I think looking at the big picture overall, they got an 8-1 to one blowout win over number 5 Alabama. First ever top 10 win excuse me, top five win even, top five win in program history. So good for those ladies. We're now 4-1 and one the year, which is great. It was a big game for Courtney Roden, 4-4 four for four with five RBIs. Awesome. So what do you think the team needs to work on heading into another big week? I think just tighten up a couple things and make sure they make the necessary in-game adjustments, and they should make it through another week pretty well. All right. Yeah, and I think the 7, 8, and 9 hitters need to be a little bit more consistent for the Knights. All three of them were hitting 250 or below this weekend. You'd really like to see that the number come up and get you know the middle and the bottom of the order to be just as productive as the top because that offensive consistency is one of the reasons the Knights were so successful last season. So maybe make a few more adjustments and get the whole order going to really pick up the offense a little bit for this coming week. Definitely, definitely. So let's move on to UCF baseball. As a team opens up this season, 
Friday night at the home at home against Siena. Justin, what do you think is the biggest storyline for the Knights ahead of the opener? I think the biggest storyline should be it should be a bounce back year for the UCF baseball team. Last year, we climbed all the way up to number six in the mm -hmm. rankings at the beginning of the season, and from there, it just didn't get any better. They went downhill, and things just didn't seem to go right for the rest of the season. I'm looking for a good year to bounce back and have a good team in Omaha, maybe. Hey, what about you, Rachel? There's a couple of different storylines that I'm looking at, and the first one is how are we going to replace all the players that we lost? Offensively, we're losing Dylan Moore, Eric Barber, Tommy Williams, you could just name almost our entire lineup graduated this past year. And what we did to replace them is we brought in a lot of junior college transfers like Eli Putnam. And they're supposed to, you know, be picking up the slack. And we're just going to have to see what's going to happen there. But another thing is the pitching. We had Zach Rogers last year. He had a fantastic year on the mound. And Finn Frock was our number two pitcher with a 3.3 ERA. Not too bad. He's got to step into that number one role this season. So that's going to be a little different for him. And then obviously Howell needs to pick it up. He's supposed to be our number two guy, and he had a 5.6 ERA last season, which really isn't too good for a top-tier starting pitcher. So we'll have to see how the pitching is going to adjust too. Definitely. But you know what? The first pitch is scheduled for 6.30 on Friday night. When we come back, we'll preview this weekend's Daytona 500. Tonight on Deals After Dark. When I think of quality sunglasses, I think of boldness, but simplicity. And nothing provides both of those more than this set. Tonight, we have a pair of beautiful used matte black Oakley Holbrook sunglasses. These glasses offer an American frame accented with metal rivets and Oakley icons, perfect for buyers seeking performance and style. And do we have a deal for you guys tonight? For the next 40 seconds, that's right, 40 seconds, you have a chance to get your hands on this exclusive featured price of $110 or best offer. This deal, usually only available on Craigslist, could be yours for the eight super easy payments of $13.75. Wow, uh, I'm now hearing that we've actually gone down to one single pair. So if you're interested in this deal or any other products from our program, you can always log on to dealsafterdark.com or call us at 1-800-555-DEAL. See you next time. DC Comics, brand new superhero collection. Oh no, Central City is under attack from Captain Cold. Luckily, the Flash is here to stop him. Captain Cold is no match for the Flash. The Green Arrow needs the Flash's help. The evil Deathstroke is trying to take over the city. The Green Arrow and Black Canary are here to stop him. Deathstroke is too strong to beat alone. With teamwork, they can defeat Deathstroke once and for all. Our heroes have saved the city. DC Comics Superhero Collection. Each figure sold separately. Welcome back. Ben Sanders is with us to talk about the Daytona 500 and the start of the NASCAR season. Ben, who do you think has a good chance to make it to the victory lane on Sunday? It's really, really hard to see past Dale Hart Jr. Like, the man is just outstanding at that side of race, type of racetrack. Last year, he uh, on the four super speedways, he uh, didn't finish worse than third, has an average finish of 1.75 on those tracks. Uh, he's won the Daytona 500 twice. He's won at Talladega seven times. He won Daytona uh, in July last year. Um, he usually has the fastest car, the best car. Um, when he goes to the top, everyone goes to the top. When he goes to the bottom, everyone goes through the bottom. It doesn't matter if he starts 35th or first. He will be in the first in the lead pack, and he will be leading by lap 10 regardless. Rachel? I think for me, a couple of people I'm looking out for are obviously Denny Hamlin. He won the Sprint Unlimited race on Saturday night. Looked pretty good in that race. Seemed like he had his car in a really good position for this weekend. And also, I think... We don't want to be overlooking 2015 champion Kyle Busch. He missed this race last year after suffering that nasty broken leg in the Xfinity race. Mm. So I think he's definitely going to want to get off to a good start in this season by having a good finish in the 500 after, you know, he had a struggle at the, in the beginning of last season but finally got a championship. Um, I do agree with the Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin is always strong at those tracks. He's been passed for the win. 
the uh, last two Daytona 500s. But the guy you've got to look at is 2015 um, Daytona 500 champion Joey Logano. Joey is so aggressive in mm. traffic. He makes gaps when there isn't gaps. He goes to the outside, he goes to the inside, he goes to the middle. He can block the entire racetrack in one move, which is frowned upon by some drivers. And that's why people really don't like racing around him a lot of the time because of his aggressiveness. But that aggressiveness and that chip he has on his shoulder to prove he's not just some rich kid with a lot of money who drives for Roger Penske. He is one of the elite drivers. He will be a future multi-time champion and he will win the Daytona 500 again. Will it be this year? Maybe if he can keep a drafting partner with him long enough on the speedway to do it. But uh, Denny, you can't really look any, high, uh, any further than, uh, than Joey Logano. Oh, I definitely agree. I think Logano also is coming into the season with a chip on his shoulder after things didn't really go his way. And speaking of that, another person we should always look out for is definitely Brad Keselowski. He's always, you know, pretty strong in these races. He had a pretty strong race the other night in the unlimited race. So I think he's definitely someone to watch out for as the week goes on in Daytona. And 20-year-old Chase Elliott, you know, I want to know how is he going to handle the pressure? Uh, Chase has always proved he's got so much poise and composure for his age. He, uh, he was, uh, for a while, the youngest winner in the truck series at 17, winning on the, uh, the road course up in Canada. As a uh, rookie, never sat in a uh, NASCAR Xfinity Series car, the second tier series, until 2014. Goes out and wins back-to-back -back at Texas, and then at the legendary Darlington Speedway, the hardest track where you're running two, three inches off the wall all night long. Took Elliott Sadler around the outside on the last lap. Chase Elliott's going to be just fine. Will he be nervous at first? Yes, he's got to be nervous. It's the Daytona 500. It's Jeff Gordon's legendary 24. But when it comes down to the end of it, Chase is a professional. He's poised. He's composed. He will be just fine, I guarantee it. Yeah, I think, you know, age is just a number for Chase Elliott. Certainly, he's not your average 20-year-old. And I think he showed that poise when he, you know, qualified first. He got on the pole. Obviously, you know, he's got all of his things together. There is a lot going on for him. He's only 20 years old. He's, you know, driving the legendary 24. But I think that he's been around racing his entire life. And he continues to positively surprise everyone in NASCAR. And I don't think Sunday will be an exception for him. Um, I want to know, is there anyone under the radar right now that you think could surprise everyone and just win the race? There's a, there's a couple names that always come up in these races. The first one has to be the one car, Jay McMurray. Jay McMurray is the 2010 Daytona 500 champion. He, um, he's won four of his seven races on restrictor plate tracks. He's always at the front. He's like, he's like Joey Logano. He's extremely, extremely aggressive. But people trust him. Jamie's been around over a decade now. He, uh, filled him, he won his second ever start. Uh, at Charlotte back in 2002. The man is just out of his mind on those tracks. He's just able to block. He's able to run the top, run the middle, run the bottom. And he never puts himself in bad spots where he gets crashed. So if he doesn't end up in someone else's mess, usually coming from the middle of the pack, then mm -hmm. he's one to look out for, for sure. Rachel? Yeah, I think pretty much anyone is capable of winning these races. We've seen the restrictor plate races before, like Trevor Bain in 2011, coming out of absolutely nowhere to be the champion. So I think one name that I'm sort of thinking of is maybe Brian Vickers. He's filling in for Tony Stewart. He's been in and out of racing due to, you know, injuries and health problems. And, you know, he blew a tire the other night, so we didn't really get to see what he had. But I think he could be an interesting name to watch Sunday as well. All right. What um, else? Do you have anything else that's on your mind about the NASCAR 500 race coming up? Uh, it's just, it's the race everyone's looking forward to. We've been sitting around for three months trying to figure out who, who's going to be in the Daytona 500, who's going to race the Daytona 500, mm -hmm. who's going to win the Daytona 500, <laughs> and then who's going to take that momentum of the 500 and go through and try and get themselves into the playoff format at the end of the season, the chase. Like, you've got to be looking at all these people to just come out and race really, really hard, put on a good show for the fans. All right, so we'll see on Sunday who takes home the trophy and an early points lead. Coming up after the break, we'll get caught up on some international soccer. Experience, the sea, art, lifestyle, travel. This is Seek to See More.
Welcome back to Hitting the Field. Connor Engelhart and Troy Kless are back again to talk about soccer overseas. Let's start off with the game of the week between Arsenal and Leicester City. Troy, how important was that win for Arsenal? It was definitely probably one of the biggest wins of Arsenal's season so far. I mean, we just saw coming into the weekend, they were kind of falling off a little bit. You know, they slipped down into fourth place. But then, you know, with this win, now they're only two points back of Leicester. So now it's going to set up for a really exciting finish to the Premier League. You know, they still have to play Spurs as well. So, you know, these top four matchups that have come out, um, they've been phenomenal, especially. And I think, you know, Arsenal, they gave themselves a huge confidence boost. So they think that they can win the title now. See, I think the way they beat Leicester City, you know, it's exactly how you expect Arsenal to win these games because, you know, they don't always play the prettiest football, but the way they get it done and, you know, the fifth minute of added time, it's just exactly what you expect. That cross in from Ozil was so nice. 17 assists on the season. He's only three shy of Henry's all-time record. And Welbeck coming in, you know, for this first game, really, of the season to actually make an impact. So this is a huge game for Arsenal, wouldn't you say, Troy? Yeah, definitely. And I think hopefully we'll see Welbeck maybe, you know, being a backup for Giroud in those sort of situations, you know, like I said, it's been like 10 months since he played some Premier League football. So I think it's important that Welbeck got that goal because now you have a little bit more depth up top. You know, you don't always have to rely on Giroud and Alexis Sanchez to get the goal. So now you have a different source. And as long as Ozil, you know, putting in crosses like that, I think Arsenal, they have a strong chance to win the league. Well, Walcott also is finally on the score sheet as well. You know, you've been waiting for him to actually do something this season. But I want to know how this, what this really means for Leicester City going forward because they had all this momentum the entire season and finally a title contender at, they actually lose to because the previous weeks they had beaten City, they had beaten Liverpool, they looked on top of the world. Now I want to see how they can handle the pressure. Even though Vardy scored in the game with the penalty, they really didn't look their you know, true counter-attacking ways they had the whole well, season. Well, you know, because the red card obviously changed a lot of things mm -hmm. and you had to take off one of your best players in Riyad Mahrez. Like, that's the biggest blow, I think, because the connection between Mahrez and Vardy is, you know, what's led to the charge to the top of the table for Leicester this season. So I think they're they're still in control of their own destiny, though. I mean, they're still two points clear, and they just got past the toughest part of their schedule. I mean, you know, save maybe a game against West Ham or even maybe Man United yeah, but if they, they get back into form. They can knock off Leicester, but I still don't really see at this point, like I said. But what about Arsenal playing this week? you know, in the Champions League against, you know, Barcelona. I well, think that's some, um, uh, you know, that's going to be a really tough uh, game for them to play, of course. I mean, I don't see them coming out I, against I think these Barcelona. other competitions are actually going to hold Arsenal back, possibly. Exactly. I think, um, uh, you know, also Man City, they have to take that into consideration as well. You know, they have sort of an easy route to go in this round of 16 match. But, you know, if they've kept, they haven't, they've only gotten one point against all the top four teams mm -hmm so far this season and if you're trying to win the title then you have to beat the best teams and you know they haven't you know showed as of lately anyway yeah. the true title contenders that they normally are no that's true yeah so spurs beat manchester city two to one in the other big matchup of the weekend um guys what is more surprising the way spurs keep winning or the way man city are falling out of the title race see i'd actually have to go with tottenham you know, keep winning because at the beginning of the season, you look at their roster compared to a team like Manchester mm -hmm. City, and you, the talent is obviously completely in favor of Man City. But the way Tottenham is just putting everything together is amazing. You have players like Harry Kane, they're literally just putting in goals. Erickson gets that pass from Lamella to get the mm -hmm. winner. All these players are just coming together. Obviously, Delhi Ali has been great, but you know, it's just remarkable how Tottenham is actually finally contending for a title. We've been talking about them pushing for the top four always, but to push for the title, this is something new from Tottenham I've never seen. Yeah, definitely. And you kind of got to, you know, almost shake your head at Man City a bit because they should be winning some of these bigger games, but they just haven't, you know, found the fluidity that they needed, like especially yesterday in the midfield. It wasn't the best performance, especially from guys like David Silva, you know, especially in the absence of Kevin De Bruyne with the injury, they need to step up and, you know, they really need to finish a, you know, finish strong in these last couple of games for the season. Mm -hmm. The Champions League knockout stage starts this week. I, I know it's a little early, but who do you guys 
see winning the Champions League this year? It's got to be Barcelona. I don't think there's anyone else out there that can compete with the attacking trio of Messi, Suarez, and Neymar. I mean, just between them, they've had like 86 goals throughout the season, and they're right now on a 30-game unbeaten streak. I don't think Arsenal is going to be slowing them down, and I don't see anyone else doing that as well. I mean, you saw last year they were able to tear apart teams like Bayern Munich and Manchester City and Juventus in the final, so I really don't see anyone else competing with this team. No, it's going to be extremely hard for any team to compete with Barcelona. Their, mm. their level is definitely up there, but I do think Bayern have a shot, at least. If there's any team... It's Bayern and then maybe Madrid, but both of those teams have tough competition You know, in the knockout stage this first round. Bayern have to play Juventus, and Madrid, I believe they got a huge game against Roma. So both those are going to be— I think they'll, they'll handle Roma just fine, but Bayern Munich and Juventus, I think that's probably the biggest game of this knockout stage because you, know, you see last year's runners-up, and semifinalists competing against each other. Juventus, they're on a hot streak right now. They won 18 games straight in Serie A coming into this upcoming week. So I think they have a really good shot. You know, they were able to, you know, frustrate teams like Real Madrid last last season in the semifinals. So they could definitely handle Bayern Munich. Well, you're talking about Juventus on a long streak. What about PSG? They haven't lost yet in the French League this season. Well, they actually haven't any faced any competition in the French League. So that's kind of part of the reason. I mean, there's this past weekend, a nil-nil draw against Lille. I mean, that was the first time they've dropped points in the league. And also, I think, you know, they're still not quite up there. I think Chelsea could give them some problems. I still think Ibrahimovic and Di Maria has also been on a new tear after last season. But I still think PSG, they're the team to watch out for and under the radar so far in the Champions League. My goodness. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching.